Well, the major market for an HIV vaccine is the developing world. And the, we spend about, oh, what, $4,000 per person per year in the United States for health care, whereas in Sub-Saharan Africa, that's closer to probably $3 per person per year for health care. And therefore, the amount of money they have to purchase a vaccine is extremely low. So that the, that the, uh, the worldwide need is in those parts of the world with the least like, uh, like uh, uh, least likely ability to pay for it, uh, but in the United States there's enough demand since there, we have 40,000 new infections a year. I think if we had a safe and effective HIV vaccine, essentially every kid would receive it, um, or at least every kid should, but would the recommendations come through quickly to do that, and there would be a, would there be a demand uh, for this uh, product, and could a company make money on it? I think you could, but it's unknown, and therefore it's tough to get your investors in that kind of an unknown uh, demand question. Here's an example. This is really an important slide. If you remember nothing else as far as value of prevention, I just took two uh, quite large drugs, uh, nice drugs. Uh, are, they, are, they, are they the best drug? Lipitor is the one to decrease your cholesterol for long-term uh, uh, decrease in cardiac uh, uh, disease, and Prilosec being a, uh, a heartburn drug uh, that's important for people with heartburn. But these are not life-saving drugs, either one of them. But they have somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, uh, $6 billion a year annual revenues from, from those drugs. On the left are all of the 20-some vaccines we have licensed in the United States. Um, uh, and you see that all of the combined have the same as one or two of these drugs. And if you look at vaccines for the developing world, which is that little uh, uh, next, the second bar on that graph, you see why you can't compete in the pharmaceutical industry. If you have to put two to three hundred million dollars into drug development, why not put it in for one of these instead of a vaccine? So this is the opportunity cost issue of, uh, for the people who have your savings and are monitoring your savings and trying to increase that with time, you would want them to maximize the return for you, the investor. And so you'd probably say, I want to be in one of these big blockbuster drugs and not necessarily in a vaccine that'll take longer and has much lower return. Pure economic question that even though you'd say that, yeah, we ought to make an AIDS vaccine, sure, but if it came to your money and say, well, you've got $10 in the bank now, but for 10 years you can triple that or I can go into the vaccine business and I don't know what the outcome is, I think you have to be, you'd be pulled on the, in the two directions of that, which would be wise for you as an individual. And that's indeed what the, the money managers are. And therefore, the opportunity cost of investing your $10 into a blockbuster uh, uh, atherosclerotic drug versus a, a vaccine uh, become obvious. So let's just look at AIDS itself. When the AIDS epidemic began, we had, well, maybe one or two partially effective antiviral drugs. Um, and if you had asked me then what we would have today, would we have a vaccine or we had an antiviral drug for AIDS, there would have been literally no question in my mind that we'd have several vaccines, and I don't know whether we'd have an antiviral drug or not. But look what's happened over, and this is market-driven, I think, rather than scientific-driven, because the science was very, very difficult at that time to make an antiviral agent. But, so, so the historic, historical aspects of this, when it began, there were many antiviral vaccines, but there were very few antiviral drugs, because they were very difficult to make. We didn't know, we had antibacterial drugs, like, uh, your penicillin and the like, but for viruses that are very small, the target is very small, and they use the cellular mechanism to replicate. When you poison the virus, you tend to poison the cell, and people got, it was very sick, much like some of the anti-cancer chemotherapy drugs. So there were very few. The development time was longer for vaccines, because in vaccines, you give it to the person, you have to wait for their immune system to go up, and then uh, you can see whether it uh, works, where, whereas in an antiviral drug, you have someone sick, you dump the drug in, if they get better, uh, you get your answer quite quickly. The social demand, as I mentioned before repeatedly, is low for vaccines, it's high for antiviral drugs, and all these things added up ultimately that the number of available antiviral drugs now is what, 15 that are licensed for HIV now, and not one uh, vaccine. Fascinating shift in terms of science. I think it's driven not only by science, though, I think it's driven by social, uh, uh, social value in the, in the market. This is compounded uh, by um, uh, the issue of uh, where in the world AIDS is. Uh, on the horizontal axis here is the gross national product uh, per capita of a variety of countries with Switzerland on the right. If any of you have been to Switzerland, uh, you can see why it has the highest uh, per capita uh, GNP. 
um, because they can afford all those lovely window boxes with the geraniums and such in the U.S. Uh, down the line. And, and you see that, that the prevalence of infection is on the vertical axis. You see that those countries with the highest amount of money able to pay for a vaccine are, uh, are uh, the ones with the lowest probably demand or interest in an HIV vaccine, whereas those, um, uh, especially southern African countries, with minimum per capita GMP have, have massive epidemics of HIV and really very limited uh, uh, ability to pay for a vaccine or, for that matter, for a therapeutic drug.